It's U of L today on 93.9 The Ville. Here's your host, Mark Hebert. And welcome to U of L today with Mark Hebert on 93.9 The Ville. So glad you're joining us for the next half hour. Usually we talk about all things U of L on this show. We talk about great research, students, programming at the University of Louisville. But today we're going to have a little bit of fun. We're going to talk elections. And we've done this before with the three guests in front of me. And at least I had a lot of fun. I don't know if they did, but we're going to talk about the elections of 2016, everything from the presidential race on down to some of the local races happening in Jefferson County, Louisville, and Kentucky. So with me today, Gary Gregg, who is the director of the McConnell Center at the University of Louisville, and he's written several books about politics and government and our way of life in the United States. Jasmine Ferrier, political science professor at UofL. She has also written some books uh, about government and our way of life and politics in the United States. And Charlie Zimmerman, who teaches communications at the University of Louisville. Charlie, have you written any books? I don't even know. If you're... Yes, but they're not about politics. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, you're our, our, our communications expert on what the messaging is uh, from, the, from the candidates here. So let's start with the top, the thing everybody's talking about, and maybe uh, everybody as they're driving down the road will turn off their radios uh, right now as we get ready to talk about the presidential race, because I think a lot of people are perhaps tired of hearing about it. But we're going to talk a little bit about how it might impact Kentucky and why Kentuckians, we think, are voting the way they are. So let's start with you, Gary. Um, why is it so predetermined in your mind that Kentuckians are going to vote for Donald Trump and it's, and it's not even any question in anybody's mind? Yeah, well, we're still a, uh, a rural state. Um, yeah, I, I uh, for a long time, been looking at the divides in this country, and the divides, I think, really come down to urban versus rural. Uh, we do not share the same values, us in the country and us in the city. We don't share the same political views. Um, it really goes back to core values. And... Uh, and so I think there's uh, there's no question that uh, that Trump is going to win uh, Kentucky as the Republicans uh, have won uh, since I guess '96 I guess it was mm -hmm. last time Democrats won, uh, and I think we're increasingly becoming a conservative state. Uh, uh, we could talk about that in, in a little while. So, but I really think it comes down to that. It's it's rural values uh, and it's white middle class, lower middle class voters that just don't share the same values as um, folks that live in the city or or half the suburbs. You guys, Charlie, Jasmine? 100 uh, percent. I travel a lot on what I refer to as plowed ground. I was down in Marshall County lately. Went into a Walmart because I needed to buy something in Benton, Kentucky. When I walked into the Walmart, everyone there was all white. They were all rural. There are, I don't know how many evangelical churches, fundamentalist churches in Marshall County. There are no synagogues or mosques or Catholic churches. There are no Muslims. There are no Jewish people, so to speak of. It, it is, as Gary says, a divide between urban areas, which are very diverse, and rural areas, which are very conservative. I also want to say, Gary, that since 1996, the Democrats have conceded this state. We've never had a presidential campaign here. There's nobody giving the other side of the story. When I was down in Marshall County, this guy stopped me in the parking lot, and he told me that coal was coming back. <laughs> and I I'm wanted, sorry, I didn't mean to laugh, but it's, it's not coming back. It's not. And I wanted to say something, and I thought, no, because the other side of the story has not been told. That whether it's explaining the Affordable Care Act or explaining why there really isn't a war on coal, there hasn't been another side to the story. Right. So it just keeps going more red. So, Jasmine, why is Kentucky so, so red? It's a mixture of dynamics. As both Gary and Charlie talked about, there's a demographic inevitability about loyalty to the Republican Party, but that same demographic, meaning lower educated, rural, lower middle class to lower class, white, evangelical, used to be Democrats. Now, of course, that was over a generation ago. There's no reason for those voters not to be wooed on economic arguments, but there are plenty of arguments against the Democrats wooing them on social policy. If they are, in these areas, still adamantly pro-life, if they are adamantly pro-church and state in some type of government capacity, if they are pro-gun, and if they are pro-traditional marriage values, they're not going to be Democrats, pure and simple. And we've seen that since parties have two types of arguments, both social policy and economic policy, you can't tell people to look one way and not the other. On the other hand, though, look at the election this year. Trump has a lot of big government economic values. You don't bring back coal if you're using the free market. If you have free market principles, you believe in free trade. Trump believes in neither of those things. And he wants to expand entitlements, which disproportionately help poor states. 
On the economic arguments, I don't see a lot of difference between. He's not the, a true Republican. He's not, and that, we'll, we'll get to that too. He's not. He's changed the party completely. If that's what a Republican is today, it's not at all recognizable. Gary, you were going to say something. You're going to no, I think uh, no, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, it's uh, I spent my lifetime thinking I understood what the Republican Party's uh, economics were, and there were free markets and uh, and free uh, free enterprise. Uh, now we, in, in a few months we've changed that, but I'm not sure he's actually changed the party. I, I kind of think. Uh, uh, maybe it's just wishful thinking that this is uh, th that he is a, a phenomenon of his own making, and he will go away and not be heard of uh, again. Um, but still, there's a lot of people that have uh, that have heard that story now. And where are they going to go after this is over? To the Democrats or to the Republicans? Who, where, what, where are we going to end up in that kind of free trade economic policy? I'm not sure we actually know that uh, yet. I agree. And do you think that that Hillary is? Perhaps Hillary Clinton is perhaps so hated in Kentucky uh, that she could lose Jefferson County, Louisville, Kentucky. Is there any way that happens, or do we vote as does Jefferson County vote as they've always voted for whoever the Democrat is running for president? Thoughts? Jefferson County will vote strongly for Secretary Clinton. Strongly. Will it be the only county in the state that she will win overwhelmingly? Maybe Lexington as well. Mm, I'm not so yeah. sure. Gary, yeah, that, thoughts on that? The only, that's the only option, yeah. I think, yeah. Yeah. Well, well, Jim Gray's in Lexington, mm -hmm. and he's mm -hmm. going to get out his vote there. It's possible she may carry Fayette County this strongly, but short of that, no. no. Do you see this election totally as I'm voting for Hillary Clinton because I hate Donald Trump and I'm scared of Donald Trump, or I'm voting for Donald Trump because I hate Hillary Clinton and I'm scared of Hillary Clinton? Is that what we're, ta we're talking about? We're not voting for a candidate. We're voting against the other person. Is that what it's come down to pretty much? I think there might be people in both camps who are very gung-ho about their candidates, but it's clearly become a very personal and rancorous election in that sense. But going back to the first question, we can't confuse personal views with partisanship, and we can't confuse partisanship with ideology. Hating the president right now does not make you a Republican if that's an ideological question. Just disliking Donald Trump does not automatically make you a Democrat. Mm -hmm. So you have to be careful here. It is personal. They're not very attractive candidates, which is an actually interesting equalizer. Among many other equalizers, they both have plenty of personal baggage. They've both been around for a long time. They've both been on the record saying a lot of things. So in some ways, they're both almost the same age. They have had mm -hmm. a lot of advantages by making sure the other person is as negative as they are. Well, can I follow yeah. up? I, I think that there is as you say, Jasmine, some support for both candidates. I particularly believe that there is a strong female cadre, uh, older women, who are supporting Hillary Clinton because she's a woman, because they've been with her since 1992 and have seen how she's been dissed by the press and, and everyone else like that. And I do believe that she's going to have a large turnout maybe that 45 to 70 year old cadre of, of especially white women. Well, there's no question that there's a block of voters who are voting for Trump because they like Trump, and there's a block of voters who are voting for Hillary Clinton. But I think the vast majority of folks in the middle that could swing either way in an election are voting for one or the other because mm -hmm. they don't like the other one. Is that, I mean, yeah. that's my sense. I yeah, mean, I that's, that's almost where I landed. I think frankly. that's exactly right. You end up with, uh, I'm, I'm putting a number on this. I have no reason to say this, but somewhere maybe 20% of each camp, or, or 20%, but basically half of each camp, in other words, 20% of the electorate are positively enthusiastic about their side. Uh, but I think all the rest in that middle, I think you're exactly right, is they see Armageddon on the other side and, uh, and they're swallowing hard and saying, okay, this is better than the alternative, and so I've got to do it. That's Gary Gregg, who's the director of the McConnell Center at the University of Louisville. We're also talking with Jasmine Ferrier, a political science professor at UofL, and Charlie Zimmerman, who teaches communications at the University of Louisville. And we're talking about the elections of 2016. I haven't heard an awful lot of talk about foreign policy uh, in this whole debate. Um, and that would seem to be the strong suit of Hillary Clinton. But she's also got Benghazi hanging around her neck and the emails mm -hmm. and those kinds of things. Is that, should that be a concern for Kentuckians as they go to the polls on Election Day, or is that not even in their minds? They're not, they're, they're not they're worried about more social issues, more wallet issues, not even worried about foreign policy, ISIS, the things that are going on in the world. We live in a very dangerous world right now. Um, we've got, uh, we don't know how many special operators are in this uh, attack on Mosul uh, in, in Iraq, so we're still fighting in Iraq right now, and Syria, and Russia's aggression. Uh, we, we live in a very dangerous world. So, uh, 
yes, they should be concerned about it. What are you going to do about it? I don't know. What, how are you going to learn what Trump is going to do? Because Trump doesn't really tell us anything uh, about what uh, he's got some uh, uh, little one-liners. But that's, that's it. And Hillary, we assume, is still the old Hillary, still probably a hawk, still ready to use military power, though she's sort of backed off that a little bit, I think, for the election. Um, but I think we don't know. So I'm not sure. At least I'm in a position where I'm not sure I know what either candidate really are going to do in foreign policy. Uh, and I think we're all sort of stuck. And maybe both candidates realize that's to their advantage is to uh, just leave it out there. Well, I think that unlike other topics, this one transcends the year's election. The truth is we don't talk about foreign policy as a society. Mm -hmm. Neither party has an ideologically distinct and consistent position on foreign policy. Which is the isolationist party and which is the interventionist party? We have no idea. What we do know is that over the past generation and a half, maybe going back to Nixon and before him Johnson and Kennedy, that they don't care about getting congressional authorization for performing acts on behalf of the United States in the world. So I would say this is a transformational institutional question and a constitutional one rather than a partisan one. We know that Hillary Clinton believes in covert action. There were just some WikiLeaks points about that, that she's inheriting a very strong presidency from Barack Obama, who himself built on the strong presidency of George W. Bush. But at least George W. Bush got a war authorization in 2002. The difference then is that Hillary Clinton is going to build on these unilateral models and she's going to do what she wants. Congress is going to be very passive, whether it's Democrat, Republican, or split. Donald Trump, we know, has authoritarian instincts, which is precisely what a unilateral actor will do, which is whatever he wants. And Congress will probably have to protest or go along or be silent, as they are wont to do. I don't see any difference, and I don't see it moving the ball in our conversations this year. Charlie, any thoughts on that one about foreign policy? Because I just, I mean, that, that's the biggest thing as a voter, as an independent voter, which I am, concerns me that there hasn't been a lot of discussion about that because that's the thing I really worry about that uh, that Hillary Clinton I don't frankly trust her um, and frankly with Donald Trump I sure as heck don't trust him and like Gary said you just don't know what either of these candidates will do once they get in office and I worry that World War three or some war with Iran or something weird is going to happen out there just because of who we elect as president and, and well, I think well, I think more people should be concerned about that but that's just my personal view do I think so yes but both Gary and Jasmine have put their finger on what the problem is. One, Congress doesn't want to, to take a vote, so they've deferred to the president. And as a result of that, we've had strong presidents who've conducted these actions, which some of us may suspect and some of us may applaud from time to time. But this is a tough issue to talk about. It's a lot easier to talk about, oh, jobs going to China or raising taxes or uh, men going, transgender people going into restrooms. It's a lot easier. And this election has fallen to the lowest common denominator. <laughs> and we're not going to have that debate. That's all there is to it. Right. Is that well, a if it's true. I mean, if you want to have a foreign policy debate, you have to have what is called political information and knowledge and literacy in the topics. Syria is not a simple black or white question. It's a proxy war. It has multiple sides. Our friends and our enemies are both trying to defeat Assad, including ISIS. So it is very complicated, and the average person does not possibly want to understand it. And of course, that happened with Iraq, where most people didn't know the difference between Sunni and Shia. And we didn't have any idea that this civil war would come. And that's at our own peril. Frankly, it's not the president's sole responsibility to educate voters. It's also members of Congress. They're listed first in the Constitution. They have the bulk of war power. The fact that they've ceded it does not make our policy better. In fact, arguments say that when you sneak into war through the back door, the outcomes are actually worse. And it's better to have full and spread responsibility. We're talking with Jasmine Ferrier, political science professor at UofL, Gary Gregg, the director of the McConnell Center, and Charlie Zimmerman, communications teacher at UofL, about the elections of 2016. A couple things uh, remaining before we go into the Senate races about uh, the presidential race. What role or non-role has the media played in this election between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton? And has it, has it been as... As, as bad and as jaded as Donald Trump claims, or are they just going where the story is? 
Yeah, this is Charlie's expertise, so I'll defer to him after I say this. <laughs> uh, yeah, of course, the media have have uh, have an incredible amount to blame uh, for uh, for this election because they have no candidate has ever gotten so much free media as Donald Trump has. No matter what he says, he gets on the media. And uh, and you what uh, you turn on flip on cable news uh, in the evenings, you'll see him covering his rallies live. Uh, and they'll be talking over or whatever, but it's just it's free media um, continually. So uh, that's one thing uh, I would say. Um, and there's there's lots of other things we can pick at, but I would certainly say they have a big responsibility for the 2016. Charlie, the problem is instantaneous social media nowadays. And if Donald Trump has a rally in Charlotte, North Carolina, and there are 8,000 people there. 8,001 of them have their phones out, and they're filming it, and it's everywhere. And if people are sitting there saying, oh, Donald Trump's having this rally, but the press isn't covering it, the press has to run to cover it because it is essentially a story. It is a difficult tightrope to walk because of social media. And I believe that this election is the very first one we've seen transformed by social media. President Obama used emails and instant messaging and everything, but this has become almost a social media, what, it, what does, um, it's horrendous, uh, to use the man's <laughs> word. Uh, it, it, it's horrendous what has happened. I it's the real world. It's the real world. It is, and I, d I don't know what you do, but it's clear that the press has reacted rather than thinking. That, that is the one criticism I would have of them. I agree with you, he's got tons a free press. The time to think this through was in February and March of this year. They didn't, and now they are reacting. <clears throat> but, but but that's the story. The Trump is what Trump is saying is the story. As a former reporter, I can tell you, I'd be doing the exact same thing probably as these news media outlets have done. Now that said, USA Today has done a, uh, some uh, great reporting, and so has the New York Times on both Trump and Hillary Clinton on their emails and on Trump's business problems and the bankruptcies and those kinds of things. So there has been some some media out there that's given a look inside both candidates. It's been washed aside by what Trump Trump says every day. What what new bombastic thing he says? Isn't but, that the? But Mark, isn't that who news? Reads the New York Times. Who reads USA Today? All right. Well, that's my point. Right. <laughs> Go ahead, I, Jasmine. I know you do, Jasmine. Jasmine. Jasmine reads the New York <laughs> <Yeah>. Times. <laughs> I get them both delivered in paper versions. USA Today oh, is an man. insert. Oh, in you're the... older than you look then. No. You get... Seven days a week. <laughs> and USA Today is an insert in the Courier Journal now. I right? understand. That. I, Jasmine, so um, do I. But okay, well, then this is a question. But, okay. <laughs> but this is a question for Mark then. Okay. If you have reporters doing investigative journalism into both sides, and you're right, mm -hmm. on the Trump side, it's a lot deeper than his latest tweet. It mm -hmm. is about his business practices, about his foundation. And for Hillary Clinton, of course, it's beyond emails, both hacked and the private server. Right. We have an extraordinarily public record of life and action. Why is it then that the tweet is the news story and the headline? Because it's easier and the public understands it. And it's easy and simple. And the public in this society that we are in right now is instantaneous. They want quick gratification. And that's just the way of the world. Um, I, I'm not saying it's right. That's just the way it is. And so, you know, that's why I was asking, did the media play some role in this? And I, I think we probably all agree. The answer is yes. The question is, were they wrong to play some role in where we are right now with these two candidates? And I don't don't have a quick answer to that one. If I could pick up on that, I think it, it goes back to Jasmine was talking about earlier about uh, before the break about foreign policy and how difficult it is to talk about it. I think this is the uh, this is the problem with like the, the two scandals. Let's say let's say all the Wiki, uh, WikiLeaks stuff coming out on Hillary and all the behind the scenes stuff in the campaign. Uh, all that stuff going on, that's kind of complicated. It's kind of difficult to follow. You, you, uh, it's a difficult story to tell. But Trump bragging about uh, sexual harassment of women is easy it's right out there and so it's we all understand it we all get it instantaneously and so it's really an unfair somewhat an unfair fight it's unfair in the in the situation that that one's just really easy and it grabs your yeah. attention it's easy to tell and the other one it's just difficult go back i wanted to jump into this point i was going to say the very same thing referring back to jasmine's comments on foreign affairs it takes someone with discipline someone with some political resiliency. That is someone, say Senator McConnell, who's going to get continually reelected and doesn't have to worry, 
who is willing to articulate these arguments on a daily basis, whether it's foreign policy or whatever else it is, and to make that the topic. People can do that. But we've been reacting to spectacular stories since the days of Joe McCarthy. That's, that's not going to change. Someone can change the debate, but it requires them to think about it, to be disciplined, to have that political resiliency to be able to carry it off. Okay, let me ask you this. Rigged elections, that's what Donald Trump has been talking about uh, for the last week or two. Is this election rigged? Is there any evidence out there or any studies that show that the election can be rigged and tainted, and especially in Kentucky? Yeah. Well, Jasmine, no. you're all looking at each other Jasmine. like, yeah. No, <laughs> for a couple of reasons. One is that elections are decentralized in the United States to pull off large-scale fraud of either voter behavior or election counts is virtually impossible if you have to fan out across hundreds if not thousands of counties that have separate auditors and that are in a statewide administration. I mean, let's look at the most obvious example. Alison Lundergan Grimes was the Secretary of State counting the election in her own election against Mitch McConnell, and she lost. Did anybody really think that she was going to steal the election from Mitch McConnell? We have a very strong t tradition of nonpartisan elections, the, old, uh, the uh, of electoral counting. The only exception is in a tight race. We can think of 1960 and Chicago and Kennedy versus Nixon. Of course, we can think about Florida and Bush versus Gore. Those were very tight elections. This may not be a tight election. The idea of calling something rigged if it's a landslide is absurd. Okay, well, let's and move on. it this early. Right, right. that's Can true. we all vote for absurd? Yeah, everybody okay. votes for absurd in here. Uh, Supreme Court nominee, um, Merrick Garland was nominated by Barack Obama back, uh, it's been about six months ago, something like that. And the Senate has said, we're not gonna take a vote on him. What if Hillary Clinton, uh, the second Tuesday in November, uh, is elected president. Does the Senate then say, well, you know what, this Merrick Garland guy ain't so bad, and we, we prefer him over, uh, over whoever Hillary's going to nominate, so uh, let's go ahead and uh, hustle this guy into, into, onto the Supreme Court. Could that happen? Well, Jasmine, you're shaking your head now. No, it wouldn't happen after January. It would happen between November That's and January. That's what I'm saying. Oh, yeah. yeah, well, it's, lame duck Congress. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to happen in a lame, lame duck president. session. And I, right. I Could it happen? You. Could, I, could I that happen? I believe it is. You do, Charlie. Do. Why, do, why do you think that will happen? If Senator Clinton or Secretary Clinton, whatever we're referring to, wins, that is the very first thing that I would do if I were Senator McConnell. And you have to remember, lame ducks are lame ducks, and they don't have to answer to anybody for a long time. I believe they're going to bring up the Trans-Pacific Partnership as well in, in that session. And if I were the Republicans, I'd sure as hell say, okay, We'll take this guy. We've had a whole nine months to look at him, and you're right. Considering the alternatives and considering maybe not passing anybody and having this stalemated Supreme Court, sure, I'd go ahead and try it, and I think that it, it could come damn close to passing. Have you been surprised that there's been virtually no focus on the Supreme Court, that the, whoever the next president is is going to basically break the tie on the Supreme Court and uh, appoint a nominee? I, I've been surprised by that, too, that there hasn't been any talk of that well, I want on either know, side. I, I've been out there. I've been in Ohio a lot lately. I've been in, as I referred to, plowed ground in Kentucky. A lot of people are talking They're about talking it about on the it. street. Okay. Yes, they yeah, are. I think it's not—I it's not, it, think neither side needs to talk about it, but it's, it's driving—I know it's driving a lot of Trump support, uh, people that are swallowing hard because they don't want to lose the, the Supreme Court, and they're willing to sacrifice other things for the next mm -hmm. couple of years. We're talking elections with Charlie Zimmerman, Jasmine Ferrier, and Gary Gregg, all from the University of Louisville. We are calling them political experts, whether they refer to themselves as that or not. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the U.S. Senate. Uh, right now, the um, the Senate, uh, let's see, is what, 53-47? No, what it's is 52 -48. it? 52-48. 52-48. Um, so there's a chance that the Democrats could take over um, the U.S. Senate. Is that going to happen, Gary, from what you've seen? I, I think it's uh, it's a to uh, co toss up right now. I think the actually Repo Democrats need four seats, as I understand it. And well, if, if they win the presidency, if, uh, if they win the presidency, and right now uh, I think real cl real, cl real clear politics this morning is giving three um, seats: uh, Indiana, Wisconsin, and Illinois, Illinois, right, uh, to them. Uh, not quite enough yet. Uh, it seems like I think that's the story of this election: is the Republicans have actually successfully so far insulated themselves from from Trump. Uh, Trump. So the states he's getting beat, beaten badly in. 
uh, the Republican candidates are still surviving. And so that, that's probably, the, if that ends up that way, that'll be the story of this election. But also turnout will drive Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Nevada, which are all swing states. Maybe Wisconsin is not so much a swing state as Nevada and Pennsylvania, but there are Senate elections there too. And it's going to be about motivating your voters. And this is why polling is very dangerous, because even on the Clinton side, if you're thinking you're having a landslide and your people stay home, that's not good for not only your presidency, but it's also not good for the down ballot candidates. Right. Just to be clear, it's 54, 44 yeah. right now, Democrats, Republicans, uh, and two independents um, who side, both of them with Both of them the, caucus with, with the Democrats. Democrats right. That's correct. Yes. So, all right. What does that mean for Senator McConnell? Let's, I mean, the guy's been the majority leader for two years now. Obviously, it's, it's good for the state of Kentucky to have someone in that kind of position. But what does it mean for Senator McConnell and the state of Kentucky if the Democrats do take over the U.S. Senate? I think that Senator McConnell will continue to be a player because the margin is going to be maybe one vote. And he is going if, – if he's not the majority leader, he's going to be the leader of, of an equal – group in in the United States Senate. Uh, he might lose the title, but I don't think he's going to lose the power. And he's a deal maker. Right. Well, no matter how many seats the Democrats pick up, they're not going to have 60. And if you don't have 60 in the Senate, then the min minority has an extraordinary amount of power. And in that sense, Senator McConnell might be even more of a force as the minority leader, which he will be reelected to. And he would be able to decide whether or not there will be filibusters, as simple as that. He has a legacy to protect. He wants to be, in some ways, like his hero, Henry Clay. Well, if that's true, now's the time for true leadership. And he was going to have to make a decision if he's going to wear his partisan hat, his institutional hat, or his policy hat, or look out for the Commonwealth of Kentucky, as he used to do, without regard to party or ideology. Right. Well, there's no more earmarks anymore, so that, that you don't have that kind of power. Which may be you can get, you a can get through it a little bit. Okay. A little bit. That's a discussion for yeah. another that's day. A, that's, that's for another day. <laughs> Let's talk about Rand Paul and Jim Gray, the Senate race. Um, what Jim, Senate race? <laughs> well, I think you just answered my question, Charlie. <laughs> what Senate race? Um, Jim Gray, Lexington mayor, uh, and he is um, the, the one thing that hasn't come out in this election too much talk about was his sexual orientation. Uh, has anyone been surprised by that, or is it just a case where? Rand Paul's winning by so much, no one's had to start the whisper campaigns. When it's not even a whisper campaign, he's out, yeah. he's out of the closet. So uh, has anybody been surprised by that? Yes. The, really? Yes, I've been surprised. Why? Because this is Kentucky. Okay. That's, I, I anticipated that that would come out early. When I've traveled, I, I've found that there are people who don't even know that. And right. so I, I've been shocked that it has not come out. But honestly, the, the issue of same-sex marriage has progressed so rapidly, I don't think any pollsters have seen an issue develop that quickly, and I'm not sure that it's the deal-breaker that it once was. The problem is more that he's a Democrat than anything else. In a Republican state on yeah, national right. scale anyway. So. And a city mayor. And right, and a city election. mayor. And as Gary said earlier, there is a real rural-urban divide. At the same time, I think that Rand Paul would be hard-pressed to say a single thing he did for the Commonwealth of Kentucky because he's really a national policy figure. He has extraordinarily interesting institutional and constitutional views, but they're not really specific to Kentucky. And an example going back earlier is Rand Paul, who's currently being criticized in ads about his foreign policy. Actually, he's very anti-presidential foreign policy, and he's somewhat isolationist. That would be a very interesting thing to talk about if we were so inclined. All right. We need to wrap this thing up real quick. Is uh, Are the Republicans going to take over the Kentucky House, the last Democratic bastion in the southern state? Are the Republicans going to take over the Kentucky House? No, but it's going to be one okay. vote. Jasmine? I would say no, but very close. Okay. I would say yes, but, but close. <laughs> but very close. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Charlie Zimmerman, Jasmine Ferry, Gary Gregg, as always, it's been fun talking to you about politics. You know I love talking about this stuff. So thank you all for joining us on L Today with Mark Hebert on 93.9 The Ville. And go Cards.